In this video, we continue our discussion of the Claisen condensation reaction by focusing on what's referred to as the Dieckmann condensation. The Dieckmann condensation is really an intramolecular Claisen reaction where you're starting with a molecule that has two ester groups present within the same molecule, and they are going to react in a Claisen type mechanism. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example so that we are clear on what this special permutation of a Claisen reaction that's referred to as the Dieckmann condensation is. So in the Dieckmann condensation, much like when we're doing an intramolecular aldol reaction, it's going to work best in situations where the product will be a five or six atom ring because of the fact that five and six atom rings have the least ring strain amongst the sp3 carbon atoms that are in that ring. They come the closest to the ideal bond angles, in other words. So let's go ahead and start off here with our choice of starting material. Going to go ahead and fill this in here. Like so. Drawing out this diester. So we have a molecule here that has two ester groups um, associated with it. I'm also going to plug in for fun an extra methyl group there in the middle. And we're going to go ahead and react this with, as we did in the last video, when we're thinking about what base and what solvent to use, we match it up with the structures of the O alkyl groups. And it's no coincidence these two O alkyl groups are the same as each other so that we can use a specific base here, which would be sodium ethoxide because we have our two carbon chain there. And then that would make the solvent that we're using to solubilize this ethanol so that the O alkyl group there matches up as well, getting that all in sync. So what's going to happen here, we'll go through the mechanism for this, emphasizing that this mechanism is very much a Claisen condensation reaction mechanism. First step, deprotonate the alpha position. And in looking at these, in most cases, you will find that when these are being used synthetically, the starting structure is symmetrical so that there's not a competition amongst deprotonation at alpha positions that are not equivalent. So we have an alpha position here, alpha position here. Due to the symmetry in the molecule, you can remove a proton from either of those two. So I'm just going to draw in my protons here on this one at the left so that I can show the ethoxide anion acting as a base to come in and grab a proton from that alpha position. That's going to force the hydrogen carbon bond to break and the electrons to go down onto the carbon atom there to give us our enolate intermediate. So I'll go ahead and draw out our enolate intermediate. So we have a hydrogen atom here, lone pair of electrons, negative charge methyl group right here, coming on down the chain, carbonyl group, oxygen, and then our two carbon chain there at the end. So we've created here at the position that I'm highlighting in yellow, we've created our carb anion, which we could show a second resonance structure where we move the lone pair electrons down to make a carbon-carbon double bond and the pi electrons out onto the oxygen. I'm not going to do that just in the interest of time and the fact that we have drawn those types of resonance structures several times before in the earlier videos. So once we have deprotonated the alpha position to create our enolate intermediate that would be resonance stabilized, we now have this carbon nucleophile all set up and ready to go. And so what will happen in this intramolecular reaction is that the lone pair electrons are going to come over and they're going to attack the other ester carbonyl group within this structure, like so. In order for that to happen, the pi electrons have to go out onto the oxygen so we never exceed the octet rule. We'll go ahead and draw out the product of this step. And in drawing the product of this step, we have to be mindful about making the proper size ring in the proper location. So I'm going to number my carbon atoms here. I'm going to start with this carbonyl. You could number them however you want. I'm doing this rather arbitrarily just so that I'm using these as markers for keeping track of who's who and who's where along our um, chain or in our ring. So we need to draw a ring 
that will have six carbon atoms in it. Because you'll notice here that one, two, three, four, five, six, carbon number six connects over to carbon number one. So I am going to draw a six atom ring, like so. And I kind of preemptively drew in this far left-hand portion of the molecule that's coming off of carbon number six. That's the portion that I'm highlighting right here in the starting material and then highlighting down here in the product. So I already drew that in. And so therefore I'm gonna correspondingly label this as number six and then adjacent to a number five, four, three, two, and one. And in our electron pushing arrow scheme, we showed that carbon number six linked to carbon number one. And so that makes sense based on what we've drawn here because we have carbon number one and carbon number six connected via that bond that I'm highlighting with my red uh, highlighter and now my laser pointer here. So we have our six atoms in the ring. Now we need to fill in what's connected to each of those six atoms. So at position number six, that's where I'll start here. At position number six, we had our ester group bonded. We still have our ester group bonded, so I've already drawn that in. Position five, there's just a CH2 group, so we leave that as is. Position four is where the methyl group is, and so I do need to draw at position four a methyl group coming off. Position number three is just a CH2, so leave that as is. Position number two is a CH2, so leave that as is. Position number one, the carbon that is number one that is in the ring is going to have coming off of it a ethoxy group and this oxygen anion. So I need to draw those two things coming off at position number one. And this is why it's really useful to be very organized about numbering your carbon atoms and such so that you know with confidence exactly where this ethoxy group needs to go in your product of this reaction. So now that we have accomplished this, I'm gonna go ahead and label step two, which we didn't already do, um, that the nucleophilic alpha carb anion is going to attack the carbonyl of that second ester group. Now that we have created the product of that step, we're onward to step three. Step three is where the carbonyl group reforms as the leaving group leaves. So to reform the carbonyl, we're gonna take the lone pair electrons from the oxygen. Those come down to make a carbon-oxygen double bond. In order for that to occur, we have to break the weakest bond here. Carbon-carbon bonds are strong, carbon-oxygen bond here weak. And so that is going to be what breaks with the electrons going on to the electronegative oxygen atom to give us our ethoxide anion like so, as well as our product of this reaction, which is going to have our six-membered ring. Connected to that six-membered ring is the methyl group at position four and our ester group right here, which was at what we were calling position six arbitrarily, and then carbonyl group right here on the ring. And so what I am circling is your major expected organic product of this reaction. And you may be looking at this and saying to yourself, hmm, is that actually a beta keto ester? Because in our original video about Claisen reactions, we described Claisen's as yielding beta keto ester products. So does this qualify? In fact, it does. So we have our ester group right here. And so therefore, the carbon that is adjacent right here will be the alpha carbon. And then the next one over is the beta. And so at that beta position, indeed, we do have a ketone or aldehyde group. So this is indeed a beta keto ester. So just like the Claisen condensation, the functional group that results from this reaction is still a beta keto ester. And so with Claisen and Diekmann, in both of those cases, it's really useful to take a look at the product that you've created and make sure that it fits with what we expect and what we need to be the case in these reactions. And that is these Claisen's and Diekmann's both yield beta keto esters. If you've created a product that has a functional group that is not a beta keto ester, it's time to go back to the drawing board and make sure that you've made all of the correct connections along the way and haven't added or deleted a carbon atom or something like that in route to your product. This is also a useful way to look at these from the perspective of synthesis, because if you look at a particular product of a reaction and you say to yourself, huh, that's a beta keto ester, you can be thinking backwards and going, okay, a Claisen condensation or a Diekmann reaction could be a useful way to craft that particular molecule. 